Hi, my name is Jay Washburn, and this is my lecture on plot. I'd like to start with a story. About a year ago, I was in a class with a guy named Doug Thayer. He was a fiction class. Um, Doug was 82 at the time, and this was his very last semester teaching, where his last class ever. He's a funny old guy, an old hooligan. Uh, so one day we're sitting around the conference table, we're doing peer workshops, and I had submitted my novel, which I was hoping would become the next catcher in the rye. And it comes to my turn, and he didn't say anything. He stood up, turned around, grabbed a marker from the board, just drew this flat black line straight across the board. Turned back around, sat down. He said, your characters are excellent, very dynamic, very realistic. Their emotions seem real. Their dialogue seems real. But your plot is just a flat line. There's nothing going on here. Nothing to intrigue a reader to keep reading. <clears throat> so I didn't deny this feedback. In fact, before I had submitted it, I knew that this was a problem. I just didn't know how to fix it. But this black line moment started me on a quest to figure out plot and figure out how I could integrate it better into my stories. So as I researched, came across a three-act structure. This is classical theater. You're familiar with that. Um, you're also familiar with the climactic mountain where you have an inciting incident and then you have rising action until you hit this climactic moment and then falling action. Uh, there's also the <clears throat> try-fail cycles, essentially where you have a hero trying, failing, trying, failing, trying, and then partially succeeding in these uh, triplets on and on until eventually the hero actually succeeds in the very end. There's also the travelogue structure which essentially has the plot is the character physically moving across a map, a physical space. This could be a character traveling across the United States or it could be a character traveling across Middle Earth but the, the progression is a physical progression. Uh, lastly, we have the hero's round, which is essentially a cycle. The hero uh, uh, starts on a quest in the beginning, goes through some major trial through the darkest place of the novel or story, and then eventually conquers and returns home. I read a book called Story Engineering. This, probably more than any of these other ideas, influenced my thinking on this. But what I'm going to present to you today is kind of a compilation of all of these. Um, it's a cycle, like the Heroes Round, but it is not simply for a quest story. This can apply very broadly, and I'll show you in the end how that works. But if you're looking to read more, read this book here. It's excellent. I'm not going to show you these videos in the screencast, but you can look at them on the slideshow below. Essentially, though, the, the naming system I got from what Mr. Cutter in the movie The Prestige calls the three acts of, of any magic trick. He says there's the pledge, then the turn, and then the prestige. And I'll, I'll go through and name all these. Now, I want to address a counter-argument before I begin. Now, most writers, from my experience, resist this idea of uh, of having a structure for a story because they, they see it as something that limits and that constricts. I really, truly do not think that that is the case. Um, I want you to look at this face here on the screen, um, and then I want you to imagine my face, right? Brad and I are pretty much twins. I think you'll agree, and, and here's why, because he and I both have eyes, we both have a nose, we both have ears, a forehead, hair, lips, a chin, we're, we're twins, right? No, uh, I'm, obviously we're not. And the reason is, in spite of the fact that we have a similar facial structure, we're two very distinct and individual uh, people. This is the same with story structure. Just because you follow the structure of a story doesn't mean you're making something that's exactly the same as something else. In fact, um, you're making something beautiful by following the structure. Now, there are some to their detriment that would like to vary from the structure and say, well, hey, I don't need a nose. That doesn't matter. And usually, instead of creating something, well, it creates something unique, but it varies from something beautiful in a lot of important ways. And story structure is simply a way to formulate a story in a beautiful way. 
Okay, now I'm going to describe to you a seven-part story structure. This is something I've kind of come come up with that's a compilation of all these different ones I studied. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting that while a lot of people argue against story structure, nobody argues against the fact that a story should start with a hook. Here you can see the seven-part cycle we're about to get into. The hook simply needs to intrigue the reader and encourage him to keep reading. It can tell something about the plot, but it doesn't have to. It just needs to be interesting in some way, intriguing. Um, Act 1 is called The Pledge, and it's named after the incident that concludes Act 1, the inciting incident, The Pledge. Um, in all this green area here, in the first act of the play, uh, of the story, you, you show your hero, and you show what his life is like, what his personality is like, you introduce uh, other main characters, especially you introduce who the antagonist is, though it's not important that you show too much how powerful the antagonist is, but you need to show how things were as the story begins. The pledge is when the hero starts on a quest. It's, it's some incident that happens that changes how everything is. So the hero's life is one way in Act 1, and then the pledge happens and everything changes dramatically. Uh, yeah, okay, so we go on to Act 2, The Turn, which is named after an incident called The Turn. Uh, the Turn is generally a moment of illumination or enlightenment where the character learns something new, it changes his understanding or his perspective. Now, The Turn event divides Act 2 into two pieces. The first half is the character responding or reacting passively. And after the turn, after that new perspective happens, then the character proactively attacks. So it's from passive to active in the two halves of Act 2. Um, the turn, the inciting incidents changes everything, right? The turn changes everything again. Now there's another important part of Act 2, and those are the pinch points. They should happen about midway in those two halves of Act 2. Um, the pinch points are when the antagonist shows his face and reminds both the protagonist and the reader how powerful he is. Now, this may be a person antagonist, but it may be an antagonistic force of some kind. doesn't matter. You need to remind the reader how bad it can be. And the second pinch point should be much more climactic, more drama than the first. So these should be increasing as they go along. In Act 2 is also when the try-fail cycles happen. So this is when the hero attempts to change things and fails, attempts again, fails, attempts again, and partially succeeds through this cycle. The final act is called The Prestige, and it's named after an event called The Prestige. It should happen about three-quarters of the way through the novel. There's what's called... The Prestige is the finalizing incident. This is the last time important information is given to the reader. Um... After this, there shouldn't be anything important, any important revelations given to the reader. The things um, that the reader knows should simply play out. Now, this doesn't mean there couldn't be a surprise at the end, but that surprise should be based on something that the reader already knew at the prestige or before. Now, in the old spaghetti westerns, occasionally the cavalry would ride in at the end and save the day, and this would be totally unexpected, and it would kind of be a betrayal of the pledge that was made in the first act. If you want to avoid this, um, this is also called Deus Ex Machina, where the, the machine comes down as God and saves the day. You don't want to do this. And to avoid this, you simply don't reveal anything important after the finalizing incident. And usually that finalizing incident, that prestige incident, is a very important moment of some kind that does change everything for the third time and also for the last time. At that point, everything plays out to the climax, where um, the climax is where everything explodes, and the tension that was set up in the inciting incident or the pledge, that's now fulfilled, and all the stress that you felt from that conflict is then relieved, the audience relax, and then you move into the resolution where all the loose ends get tied up, and essentially the cycle is complete. So now that we understand this structure, I'd like to talk about how it applies. I actually read seven books as I was studying plot, and I looked at how each of them fit with this seven-part plot structure. And I discovered some interesting things. First, Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is nonfiction. 
That means you can't just change events and make them fit how you want. However, he uses, uh, through the clever use of flashbacks and kind of odd arrangement, he actually makes his story fit this structure very well. I, I don't think he meant to purposefully, but surprisingly, it does fit. Going on, Slaughterhouse Five is a nonlinear story. It, it starts with the end, jumps to the beginning, jumps to the end, the middle, the the beginning. It just goes all over the place chronologically. And yet, if you just look at it scene by scene, it's clear that it also follows a seven-part structure. And uh, if you want to look at the notes, my notes below, it shows how this is all laid out. Another one I want to talk about is the Lovely Bones. The Lovely Bones does not have a single protagonist. I would say that the entire family together is the protagonist, which is very different than like your typical quest story where there's this hero going on a quest. The Lovely Bones, in spite of the fact that it doesn't have a single protagonist, fits this structure. This surprised me a lot too. But the point of this is that there's a great variety of stories that fit this structure. Now, I talked about how some people are outliners while other people just like to wing it as they as they write a story. They like to let the story grow as it goes. And I, I want to tell you that if that's the way you write, keep writing that way because this story structure is something that can be applied in the revision process. Now, a good story is probably revised at least eight times, if not more like 20. But it's during this revision process that you can go back and you can make sure, okay, well, at about a quarter of the way in, do I have an inciting incident? And about halfway through, do I have a turning point that changes everything again? And do I have pinch points at the right spot? You can adjust your story so that the pacing fits this, uh, this structure, and it will help make it more intriguing so that your reader doesn't just say, oh, no, this plot is very flat. Okay, now, the theme of this lecture is supposed to be fractals and I'm sorry but it's just going to be right at the very end but a fractal is a math mathematical structure that is self-similar has a fine structure at small and large scales it's repeating it's simple and recursive <clears throat> and then also it's too irregular to be easily described and I love that part it's kind of a paradox that it's repeating and yet it's very complex um, so if you see that little red square, we zoom in on it right here, and you see that the same alien snowman shape that we saw on the other scale, we see at this scale. Uh, here's another three-dimensional fractal, which I thought was kind of cool. But again, it's very simply defined, and yet the way it repeats itself and stretches out is very hard to define. So this plot structure, this fractal, can be repeated on multiple levels. So we've looked at it in a single story, but it also applies in a, in a series and you can see that very easily in the Harry Potter series for example right seven books together and we have this uh, this inciting incident at the beginning that shows us that Voldemort is a problem he's ruining the whole world and when he is destroyed and defeated at the very end we feel that the story is over and if Rowling had just gone off and kept telling the story in spite of Voldemort being over, we all would have gotten very bored. That's why the prologue sums up several, many, many years in just a couple of pages. Because the story is over when Voldemort is dead. Now, that's on the series level. When Voldemort's over, when the climax happens, the cycle is over and the story is done. That, however can and should be applied on the scene level as well, where there, each scene has a conflict and a specific purpose. This was a huge revelation to me, but I learned that when the conflict of the scene is over, the scene needs to end. And if a scene doesn't have a conflict, it needs to be taken out. Essentially, if there's no Voldemort in your scene, you have no scene, and you're going to bore your readers if you continue with that. Okay, um, here's a pitch. In case you saw this video shared somewhere else, my website is jwashburn.com, and you can read more about writing and more of my writing at this URL, jwashburn.com. Have a great day.